everyone. Welcome to the second video in the Pete McKee Art History series. If you are new to this channel, then thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share if you enjoy this video. I'm Ellen, the curator at the McKee Gallery, and today we'll be looking at one of Pete McKee's works of art and we'll discuss its influences. If you are not familiar with who Pete McKee is, then please check out the beginning of our first video, which gives insight into how Pete became an artist and the style he is known for. A link to this video can be found below. Today's painting is Brian Wilson's Broken Heart Club Band. Depicted as the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson slumped on a bed. His right arm hangs limply to the floor whilst he loosely holds the Beatles' 1967 album sleeve, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. A record player stands in front of his bed, its lid raised whilst the plug cable snakes off out of sight towards the bottom right hand corner of the painting, telling us that Wilson is listening to the record that he holds in his hand. In his left hand is a piece of paper, almost blank were it not for the single word smile written at the top. The discarded glasses on the floor to the left, in addition to Wilson's defeated and soporific state, suggest that whatever he was doing, he is now given up on. So what exactly is going on in this painting? What has happened to Wilson and why is he so dejected? And also, what famous artist influenced this painting in the first place? Before we discuss this, it is important to give a little context into who Wilson is and his rise to fame as a member of the American rock band The Beach Boys. The band was formed in Hawthorne, California in 1961 and was originally made up of three brothers, Brian, Carl and Dennis Wilson, their cousin Mike Love and school friend Al Jardine. They achieved enormous success with their iconic surf rock music that became synonymous with Californian sound. They were first managed by their father, Murray Wilson, who was also a musician and was known for his tough and business-like approach. After initially capturing a following by winning a local radio competition with their track Surfing, their local popularity grew quickly. They were signed to Capitol Records in 1962. By the time they released their second album, Surfing USA, the band were number three in the national US charts. Worldwide fame quickly followed as their distinctive vocals and repeated use of complex harmonies were unique. However, things began to get increasingly difficult for Brian, who was put under mounting pressure by their manager to constantly produce hit after hit. As well as writing the songs, Wilson was producing, composing and arranging them too. Despite being pulled in one direction by both the band and their manager, who wanted him to stick to the surf rock formula, he was determined to start moving away from what the Beach Boys had initially become so famous for and was intent on removing himself from the tedium caused by writing songs about the same tropes. In an episode on the Beach Boys from the BBC's 2001 to 2002 series, Art That Shook the World, Wilson reflected on this difficult time. The songs all came easy, we milked it dry, we got every possible angle and song that we can get about surfing, and then we went on to cars. We did the car routine, but to me we just needed to grow artistically. By 1963, Wilson had been the driving force behind four hit albums and nearly a dozen singles. However, when the Beatles appeared on the American music scene in 1964, they soon replaced the Beach Boys as the country's favorite band. As the spotlight shifted, the Beach Boys manager laid further pressure on Wilson, which subsequently led to Murray being fired, an extremely difficult time for both Murray and the band. Wilson then went on to create I Get Around, which reached number one on the Billboard charts, temporarily taking back the spotlight from the Beatles. However, Wilson was still not content, his primary goal to create an album that was fresh, groundbreaking and allowed him to express his creative genius. On hearing the Beatles' 1965 concept album Rubber Soul, Wilson was blown away, spurring him on to create something that could at least rival it. Rubber Soul blew my mind. When I heard Rubber Soul, I said, that's it, that's all, that's all folks. I said, I'm going to make an album really good, really challenge me. So he could focus on working on a new album, Wilson retired from the world of touring that had made him feel depressed and anxious, particularly as he didn't like to fly. This was how he came to write the Beach Boys' famous album, Pet Sounds, now recognized as a product of creative genius. Pet Sounds came in at number two on the Rolling Stones list of 500 greatest albums of all time. This was after two extensive polls taken in 2003 and 2009, where a panel of several hundred artists, producers, industry executives, and journalists voted. The list even includes albums from the 2000s. 
the magazine stated, with its vivid orchestration, lyrical ambition, elegant pacing and thematic coherence, Pet Sounds invented and in some sense perfected the idea that an album could be more than the sum of its parts. Pet Sounds was incredibly personal to Wilson and has been described as the soundtrack of his life. Not just because he mainly created the entire album himself, relying on the band just for their vocal harmonies, but because it also tapped into his personal life, even writing about the love he felt for his wife at the time. Sadly, the album did not do as well as he hoped. In the previously mentioned BBC documentary, host Mark Lamar explained that Pet Sounds was released in the spring of 1966, but even Beach Boy fans were bewildered. There was nothing in the American pop scene at the time to match the musical sophistication, and the album peaked at a disappointing number 10 in the charts. It was after this that Wilson began working on Smile, an album that was worked on between 1966 to 67, but was never completed. This is what the bare page in Pete's painting refers to. There are many versions, rumours and theories as to what was the catalyst to Wilson becoming a recluse for so many years. It is clear that this would have been down to multiple and complicated factors, but what Pete has portrayed in his painting is one particular theory, which is also referenced in the title of the work. When writing about this painting, Pete said, Legend has it that when trying to complete the Beach Boys concept album Smile, Brian Wilson was battling many demons. Seeing the Beatles' Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band reach number one in the charts was the final straw. Wilson gave up recording the album, went home, closed the door and took to his bed. This was the beginning of Wilson's spiral into seclusion and the end of his career in the band. In 1967, the Beach Boys were booked to headline the Monterey Pop Festival, an extremely significant pop festival in American culture, but Wilson pulled out of performing on the Saturday slot, in turn damaging the band's career. However, the band did continue without Wilson, releasing seven albums before regaining popularity in the early 70s. However, it wasn't their choice to continue without him. After the Monterey incident, the band tried to pull Wilson out of his depression, even going to the lengths of building a studio in his house, but despite this, he wouldn't get out of bed. Hal Blaine, percussion on Pet Sounds, described the change he saw in Wilson. I saw him go from this thin, gorgeous young man to 350 pound. You would never recognize him, and he lived literally in his bathrobe, in the bed, for a number of years. Now that we have discussed the context of Pete's painting and the musical reference it depicts, I will now explain the painting that inspired the composition of this work. The Death of Marat is an iconic work of art on display in Brussels' Royal Museum of Fine Arts of Belgium and was painted by French neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David, born in 1748. This grisly portrait served as propaganda for the cause of the French Revolution. The man in the painting is Jean-Paul Marat, one of the revolution's most notorious leaders and a friend of David, who came to be recognised as the painter of the revolutionary regime. The uprising began in 1789, lasting until 1794, commencing with the overthrow of the monarchy headed by King Louis XVI and its replacement by an increasingly murderous government. The king's lavish spending and the country's expensive involvement in the American War of Independence had brought France to the verge of bankruptcy. To tackle this, the king raised taxes despite the country having suffered two decades of drought, bad harvests and cattle disease, thus plunging the majority of the people of France into even greater poverty. Their voices were ignored by the monarch, church and nobility, culminating in the revolution, which began with the storming of the Bastille, a state prison. The death of Marat was made the same year Marat was assassinated by Charlotte Corday, a member of the anti-revolutionary nobility. His lifeless body slumps over the bathtub, evoking images of a dead Christ to provoke sympathy and to betray him as a selfless martyr to the revolution. The letter in his left hand was used to gain entry by the murderer, who stabbed Marat with a knife that lies on the floor to the left. Although Marat was in fact disfigured by a severe skin condition, which is why he used his bath as an office and has wrapped his head in a vinegar-soaked turban, he has been painted as handsome, in a neoclassical style like a Grecian statue, his body muscular and athletic. The narrative is of a beautiful hero who has died for the cause. David honours him by painting a simple epitaph to Marat on the wooden plinth beside the bathtub. It is symbolic that Pete chose to channel David's The Death of Marat in his own painting. He does this by replicating the pose of Marat in his own work, as well as the paper he holds. 
The record player in Pete's painting replaces the wooden plinth seen in the original, as well as swapping the bath out for the bed Wilson lies on. Fortunately, after years away from the Beach Boys, Wilson eventually began touring again in 2002, and even released the Smile Sessions, tackling this former creative demon, coming back to thousands of adoring fans. However, the moment Pete's painting references was arguably, at the time, the death of Wilson's career, which Pete symbolises by referencing an actual physical death that occurs in David's painting. As mentioned, David portrayed Marat as a martyr by posing him like Christ after his crucifixion when he is taken down from the cross. This scene has been depicted in many paintings throughout history, this particular moment referred to as the 13th station of the cross. By referencing this in his own painting, Peter is suggesting that Wilson was a martyr for his art and was willing to suffer to create music that gave so many people joy. Since Wilson began touring in 2002, he has fortunately been able to make a successful comeback, travelling the world so he can perform the iconic songs that changed the history of music forever. We hope you've enjoyed the insights into this episode's painting and we look forward to sharing the next one with you soon. Many thanks for watching.